Um, okay, uh, we're going to talk about the rhythm vector method today. Um, but before I launch and do that, um, any questions about Caroline? Does the homework you're reading? Um, I don't, I, I turned it into homework, so I, I can't add it. Oh, you, you turned in which homework? Yeah. Homework three. Homework three. That's the one on divergence and nonlinearity and so forth? Yeah. Oh, you can ask questions about that. We're here to learn. So, and I'll, uh, of course, the fact that you ask the question does not imply necessarily that I will answer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Why? So there was, um, I, I would like to have the expression in front of me so I can see it. But, but, Someone has solved it by solving for U, and other people solved it by solving for alpha. Yeah. And, like, will, will they provide different results, or are you aware? Well, there's a relationship between Q, yeah. or the non-dimensional Q, and alpha, right? Mm -hmm. And I want you to plot that. Uh, whether you think of one as being given an element to be determined is up to you. Yeah, that's what I thought, but we had different... So that's why I was well. I would I would have thought it would have been easier. Well, maybe not clearly specific. Q appears as a linear in a linear fashion, right? Mm -hmm. And alpha is nonlinear. For the case where C M A C is zero, mm -hmm. it's only a quadratic alpha, right? So it's a quadratic formula. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that case, that's the easiest case, right? Well, to me, I saw Q as a function of alpha, and it didn't matter what value. Well, let me uh, draw a picture. Um, yeah, I was going to talk about real arithmetic, but since you asked about it, we're talking about homework number three, right? And let's say you've got alpha, and then... Uh, you're going to plot this versus Q over Q divergence, right? Where Q divergence is the number you get from the linear model, right? Yeah. But when, when, when there's a nonlinearity, then there's always a question of what do I find as Q divergence? Because what happens physically is it doesn't, the alpha doesn't go to infinity once I put the nonlinearity in, right? But you still, but if, if you look at C M A C is actually equal to zero, then I, I forgot what the form is, but we get here. Anyway, it's a quadratic and alpha, right? Mm -hmm. So then, when you plot it, uh, you know, here, here's q over q sub d equal, or, or here's q over q sub d in general, and then this is 1, and now I'm going to plot alpha over that, right? Yeah. For CMAC 0, it's going to, the, alpha, the only solution is alpha equal 0 up to this point. And then it, it goes like this, right? Okay. Okay. And so in that case, we want to lose it. Now, when CMAC is not zero, and I want to construct the same plot, mm -hmm. uh, you can do a, a couple of different things. Um, it might be mathematically easier to specify an alpha and find to increase emergence. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what, that's what right. I mean, but then you have to recognize that you need to look at a range of alpha because what, what the, the, the graphs I'm going to look like, I, I move one, probably shouldn't do that. One is still over here someplace. So now the graph is going to look like, uh, well, this it depends on whether this is positive or negative. If there's a memory image, if I flip side of this, right? I think if it's positive, it'll go like this, and go like this, and then it'll go like this, and then there'll be another solution like this. So, uh, if you specify alpha and find Q, on, up, up to a certain point, there's only going to be one solution, thing with this branch, and then beyond that, there's going to be uh, three different alphas 
right to the cube. But 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 as long as you as long as you vary out the from minus to plus over some range, you should be able to get the I would think you get the whole curve by specifying alpha and finding q. The other possibility of course is you can you can go in the map lab with some piece of software and find the the roots of a of a cubic type. You should get the same answer. You wouldn't? I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. And that's why I was surprised because in my mind any way it could work because it's just like Well this is this is what this is what the curve should look like. Did, did you get this answer or not? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think I mean a full bulk of this two key? Uh sorry. A full bulk of this two clause the K and the K are also one. Oh, uh, I, 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 this is this is why I'm thinking of uh, where the K is not zero, but the the, 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 the ratio of the, of the nonlinear step is the nonlinear step is, is not zero, but the ratio of the nonlinear aerodynamic term to length term is zero. Yeah, we call that C L. You know, why we call this K three one? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, so I thought similar with it, but a little bit different. It starts from minus one, not from zero. Well, uh, it's like song here. Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't tell you. Sorry. No, I would start from minus one to. No, not start from. I would say start from minus one. Okay. Well, I'd have to go back and look at the okay. place. That could be true. That could be true. It could start out fine. I'd say it could start out fine. But he, he wants you. Yeah. He wants But I'm sorry, Scott Bone, we're talking to ourselves here. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the students was saying that when he solved the problem, uh, for the case where CM is, is, is positive, is that right? Yeah. Okay, it's going to zero. It, it, alpha started out with a minus sign and then went like this and then you had another term. Oops. Yeah, give me the other. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it's possible. Okay, that, yeah, that actually is a good question. Oh, why was that? Oh, it doesn't answer my own question. I'm saying the real question of like whether you solve for alpha or excuse me. Oh. When you get the same answer. You should be able to get the same answer, yeah. Yeah. And and there would be some advantage, uh, because you're solving a linear equation for Q given alpha and you're solving a cubic equation for alpha given Q, right? So mm -hmm. so this is the passage of the computation. Other questions? Stockholm, do you have any questions? Hearing none. <laughs> Hello? Oh, no. Okay. Ingrid? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to... It's really 10 seconds. Hello? I think it's 5 seconds for them to hear me and then 5 seconds. <laughs> so it sounds like... Right? Hello? Okay. Really rip. Moving right along. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I, I want to ask, uh, like, how would be the behavior of graph when the case is, when the CM ACL is zero, and uh, the stiffness and aerodynamic uh, nonlinearities are one? What, what the curve should look like? Yeah, yeah. No, the answer is I haven't done the calculations, so until I get the homework, I don't know. But it should... It should Look, it's not going to look wildly different from the case where CMAC is to zero, right? I mean, when CMAC is zero, then you have symmetry, right? And you're going to break that symmetry when you when you induce CMAC. So, so the curves qualitatively should look like what we've been sketching just now, but numerically, of course, they will they will change. Does that help you? Yeah, because what we have got is like zero for all the Q by Q D. Yeah, I was. I think your question is, would you start out with CMAC zero? Then? I would do that first. Yeah, because that's it. Yeah, yeah. When CMAC is zero, yeah. and both the nonlinearities are considered as one, yeah. both the nonlinearities are considered, as, then we get a, a zero deflection for all values of Q by Q D. Because all the roots are imaginary. I don't think so. I mean, I haven't done the numerics. Is that what other people found? They found yeah, yeah, but it depends on the way they implement the study. So, like, I had a, I implemented a detection algorithm to solve the cubic stuff yeah. when CMAC was equal to 1. Yeah. And the fact that CMAC equal to 0, it's only found the imaginary and real equal to 0. Then if CMAC is equal to 0, could that solve the other equation? So, for example,
down the equation outside of the algorithm and as a quadratic form in alpha. Because the algorithm fails when you get, when you give TM and it's equal to zero. Are, are you saying that the particular algorithm you use to solve the equations fail? Yeah. But when you found one that did work. Oh, I can purchase the equation because TM is equal zero is a quadratic in alpha. Yeah. So I could solve it right. more easily and in the right way. Because yeah. the algorithm actually said it's cubic, yeah. but if it's no longer cubic, it doesn't work anymore. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, but I, what I did was, uh, I did not solve the cubic equation. I, uh, I put CMS equal to zero, and then I get the quadratic, uh, alpha square. Equation in the form of alpha square is equal to some, uh, function of Q. Okay, well, let's, let's go back and look at the, uh, equation you're trying to solve, because I, I, I you may be right, but I, I am surprised that it turned out to be that way. Uh, yeah, because hmm. if, at the condition CMS equal to zero and uh, both the nominalities as one, the yeah. equation as alpha square is equal to minus one. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Uh, let me write down that question. Does someone have that equation form that we use for the homework, the non-dimensional form of it? Yes. Uh, Q CMS. Well, oh yeah. Okay, let's write down this equation. We've got Q bar, or Q tilde, that's the ratio, Q, Q tilde is, the, I assume, the ratio of Q over Q sub D, is that right? Yeah, thank you. And then we've got, uh, I can't read your right Q here. Plus Q tilde and alpha. No, Q tilde, CMAC. Or just a CMAC, yeah. Or CMAC tilde, probably, right? No. No, just CMAC. Plus Q tilde and alpha. Negative or positive? Yeah. yeah, there's minus alpha and minus k alpha c1 alpha cubed. It's a, there's a missing term. Well, you yeah. want an alpha here. You want this as this according? Oh, no, no. There is another term, which is minus alpha. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I see. There's a layer term still. Yeah. Can you move the can you move the notepad to the towards left? Uh, we I can see it okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do we agree that this is an equation? The yes, left. I did. I just did. You know, I'm not sure I can focus it a little better. Yes, it is right. Yeah, it's right. Uh, is that better? Do we agree that this is the equation we're trying to solve? Yes. Okay, great. All right. And now you're looking at, in particular, at the case where CL alpha 31 is 1, A31 alpha is equal to 1, is that right? And you want to look at also the CMAC is equal to 1, is that the case you're looking at? Is equal to 0. Oh, you want to look at that as 0. Okay. Okay. Then if that's 0, then then this equation 1 will reduce to a quadratic, right? We can count it. So one, yes, if it's one possible solution to uh, equation 1 with CMAC equal to zero is always alpha equals zero, right? That's always a solution. It may be a uh, an unstable solution or a stable solution, depending on whether I'm above or below divergence Q, right? If I'm above or below Q, tilde equals one, but it's, it, that's always a solution. 
And then, uh, in addition, when, when Q tilde is greater than 1, if I just look at the linear terms, then there's now, will now be three solutions, right? Including the one that's alpha equals 0, plus two others. Do we agree with that? Hello? Can you repeat? Can you repeat, please? Yeah. So, so now, if, if, here's, here's what I'm saying. If Q tilde is less than 1, Alpha equals zero is the only solution. Okay? For Q tilde greater than one, there are now three possible solutions. For uh, alpha, including the one where alpha is equal to zero. And the other two we can solve by, determine by solving the quadratic equation. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Good. All right. So let's keep going and we can make some further progress. So now, uh, I'll call this the reduced form, the quadratic reduced form. Once we factor out the alpha, right? So now we have Q tilde plus Q tilde C real alpha through 1 alpha squared minus 1 minus K3 1 alpha alpha squared equals 0, right? And now yeah. you want to set this equal to 1 and this equal to 1. Okay? So let's see what we've got. We've got Q tilde uh, minus 1. I'm going to rearrange these terms. So I'm taking so this term and this term. And then I have plus alpha squared times Q tilde uh, minus 1 equal 0. Okay. And now uh, we can solve for attempt to solve for alpha squared. And that's, this is pretty tough. Ah, so alpha squared is uh, minus one. It looks like right. Oh. It's minus. And alpha therefore is plus or minus i. Is that what you got? Yeah, plus minus i. Okay. Well, I think you're right. <laughs> I didn't realize that was such a special case, but it is. So what does that mean physically? Well, yeah. there's only the real roots, and it's alpha is equal to zero for all q. Yeah, yeah, it looks that way. It's that way. And I guess that's because I, we chose these very special coefficients, right? And probably this one is unrealistically large because uh, that's going to give us uh, a nonlinear uh, lift. And a small alpha. So. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that special case is going to be so tricky, but you got the right answer. So, congratulations. Hello? Uh, one, one more question. <laughs> okay. So, when we talk about yeah, the solution is stable or not stable, yeah. so, uh, like, if the uh, deflection increases with the increasing divergence, uh, increasing dynamic pressure. Yeah. That is the trend which is shown by the plot. Then we say, say it is a stable solution, right? Well, are you asking me what do I mean when I say it's stable? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm invoking knowledge that isn't in anything we've discussed up to this point. To to really uh, investigate whether these solutions are stable or unstable, I would have to do a dynamic analysis, and I've done that in times past, <laughs> so I know the answer. But based on statics, uh, I don't think you could determine that, although you might be able to do it by looking at this. No. Looking at the plot size, like uh, you, might, you, you might be able to do it by, you know, this is like static coupling, right? And you can look at the second derivative of the potential energy and sometimes it where whether the static solution is statically stable or not. But I think a better way to do it would be to do a dynamic analysis. 
But the point I, I the basic point I would make is when I say it's stable or unstable, I'm I'm using knowledge that's not contained in anything we've discussed up to this point. So you shouldn't necessarily know. <laughs> uh, because, uh, I was what I was thinking while solving the assignment is like if the if the deflection increases with the dynamic pressure, then it is stable. If the deflection decreases with dynamic pressure, increasing dynamic pressure, then it's unstable. So that was the logic I was thinking about. Yeah. If the deflection decreases, then you are increasing the dynamic pressure. Yeah. So it's unstable. Yeah. Well, ideally, if it's decreasing, that was the logic I was thinking about. Well, that, that's, a, that's a good thought. Uh, getting back to this curve, if you see this curve, this is the one for CMAC equal zero. Uh, yeah. And this is the one where, where uh, I think uh, K3 uh, three, alpha 3-1. Three, one. And both are one. one and C alpha, L alpha 3-1 is, say, zero. Uh, it turns out that, that this branch, which I'll draw now as a dotted line, if I give the system even a small perturbation, strictly speaking, an infinitesimal perturbation, then the solution will always dynamically move away from the solution. They either go here or here. And which one of these I go to depends on the kind of perturbation, the sign of it, and the magnitude of it. But then, and that's usually what people mean by linear stability, a linear stability criterion, or infinitesimal stability criterion. But then if I'm on this branch, and I give the system a big enough kick, I can go down to this one, right? Or vice versa. But that, that, but that would not be true for a small perturbation. If I give the solution a small perturbation near this branch, dynamically it will oscillate and then it will go back to this branch. So if I kick it enough, it will go over this branch. So the whole issue of stability is, uh, and which branch I'm on or will be on is a, is a more subtle question. Process outside of switch branches, which means it means that it is positive alpha and negative alpha. Right? That is either either way, either. Both of these are possible solutions. And which one I reach depends on other things other than this static model. It depends on, on how I disturb the system. Or, as we saw before, if now I look at CMAC not zero, but this is still now K31. K alpha 3 1, just K alpha, whatever it is, equal to 1, and then CL alpha 3 1 equal to 0. Uh, but now CMAC is not 0. Uh, now I, I've got, I've got, I've still got three branches, right? But now you want to start with the first branch. It's unstable. This, this part of the branch is unstable. Because this is the one that was, as, as CMAC tends to zero, this is the one that goes back to the horizontal line. So the whole issue of stability of these branches is, is beyond our current model to say much about because it's a static analysis. But if, if Q, if Q over C D is greater than one, no. I mean, that means you're above the divergent um, pressure, right? Well, what this nonlinear analysis says, for example, if I take this curve, mm -hmm. what this says is if I uh, start out on this branch and I don't, don't perturb it very much, mm -hmm. <laughs> I will continue on this branch forever. Okay. To get to this branch, this part of this whole branch, this part which is stable, I would need to disturb the system in some particular way so I could jump from here to here. Now, once I'm on this branch, by whatever means I've managed to get on that branch, it again will be stable with respect to small perturbations. But again, if, I, if I'm on this branch and I kick it just the right way, uh, I could presumably go back to this branch. Okay. And then the physical world, if something like this is happening, and I'm going to say I'm fine to do turbulence, so I have some continuing dynamic excitation system. If the turbulence, the, the turbulence is small, I'll probably just stay in this branch, right? Yeah. But if the surface, if I was flying to a fairly severe storm, I can imagine getting kicked from this branch back to this branch. And it's 
said that, I doubt if anyone wants to build an airplane where I'm great at, at a key way to do that. But sometimes people build airplanes thinking that they're below key divergence, and they're not. Uh, I can't tell you too much about this because this is a legal case, but I was once an expert witness um, for a case where they lost the airplane. It turned out they lost the plane due to divergence. And, uh, which was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Um, but, I don't know, I guess I can tell you this one. They weren't really beyond their bridge. What they were, they were probably, they had a cumulative QCD of about 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Mm -hmm. And the point is, Alpha got big enough because of this, right? Alpha got big enough, they exceeded the yield stress of the, of the structure. And they lost the structure. And the structure of the Control service, not the logic control service. So, okay, uh, let's see. Have, have we have we done everything we need to do with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it's interesting. I didn't realize that we chose those special values and we got strange results. But it was a learning experience, right? Okay. Now are we ready to talk about really good? Ah, uh, good. Uh, I, I, okay, I, I'll give you these pages too. This is January 30th, is that right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Did I do this now? No, I'm trying to do this. Okay. All right. So, really risk. Why are we going to talk about really risk? So, let me motivate this and then tell you what it is. Um, really risk has an alternative. to the Gordon method. I'm sure you all remember what the Gordon method is, but just in case <laughs> you've forgotten, uh, let me go back to a, a, a model here behind the right page. Yeah. So uh, we were looking at, at uh, our model of a wing, well, this is the y-axis, the elastic axis, and we had a model that said d d y of g j d alpha d y plus q b e, uh, c d c l d alpha times alpha plus alpha naught equals zero, where alpha naught was the uh, original untwisted angle of attack at the root, right? And alpha is the twist of, of the, of the uh, wing as a result of, of the loading and the elasticity of the structure. And we said when gj or c or e or some of these other quantities depend on y, in general it's going to be difficult to find an exact solution because you have a different equation of coefficients which depend on y, right? That makes it more difficult. So we said, oh, what we can do is we can take alpha y and express it as a sum of terms, some coefficients a sub n, which we hope to determine. And some functions alpha of n of y, which we will choose carefully and appropriately. That just means we have to think about it, right? And uh, I said that if the boundary conditions uh, are still the same, namely is alpha zero here and the alpha dy is zero here, I can use the I can for these functions I can use the uh, uh, I can I can use the uh, same functions that I found by looking at the special case where G J E C and so forth were independent of y were constant. So that's straightforward. So the Blurcher's method, I'll call this equation one, this equation two. Blurcher's method is you put two into one, 
and then multiply the result. In turn, that is once at a time, by say alpha sub i to distinguish it from alpha sub n, and do this for i equals 1 up to 17, if we have 17 terms in our series, and generate 17 equations and 17 unknowns and away we go, right? That works fine as long as I have the alphas satisfying the boundary conditions that are appropriate to the new problem. Sometimes that's not entirely easy to do. And in one of your current homework, it's an example. In the current homework, the tall current homework, In the current homework, we're going to put a, a spring. We have a torsional spring. At the root. Right? So, for example, the, the potential energy is now one half integral from zero to L is gj d alpha dy squared dy plus one half k sub alpha times alpha squared at y equals zero. This is at the root, right? And you are going to work out the boundary conditions associated with that. And you're also going to work out the functions, the eigenfunctions that correspond to this case, which are different from the eigenfunctions corresponding to the case where this is fixed at the root. And now, if I, in addition, of course, in your homework, you're, not, you're allowed to assume that E and C and D, J are all constant. But I said, well, that's okay for a warm-up, but now you you need to do it for a real wing where those things vary. So then the question is, what functions am I going to use? One thing I could do is I could solve the constant property case for every possible value of k alpha eventually. And then when I when I vary E, C, and G, J, and so forth, with respect to Y, I could each time use a different set of functions. You can do that. But wouldn't it be nice to just use one set of functions? <laughs> right? For all values of k alpha, and for all possible values, values or functions E, C, and G, J, is one to one. Wouldn't that be nicer? Because that's what people do this for a living to do. <laughs> okay. Then the question is, what functions am I going to use? And remember, the, the boundary condition and the functions change with K alpha. So what I would really like to do is have a method which allows me to use a certain set of functions, which don't, which individually do not necessarily satisfy the, the boundary condition associated with k alpha being something finite. And Glurton method doesn't do the job. So no, nowhere in Glurton's method do I just try to. Is there any way of satisfying the boundary conditions other than choosing those functions such that they do individually satisfy the boundary Are you still with me? Well, Rayleigh and Ritz have a method that will do the job. So that's why we're going to talk about Rayleigh. Okay. So let's talk about Rayleigh. So, Rayleigh Ritz does the following. It starts out with potential energy and virtual work, and never really gets to the difference equation of boundary conditions. In Rayleigh Ritz, you never find the difference equation of boundary conditions. I'm not saying that's not interesting for certain purposes, but in Rayleigh Ritz, you don't do that. But you still end up with equations that allow you to determine these coefficients based on that. But it's what you want to do. Anyway, you use them, right? So let's go back to uh, the more basic. Um, 
we're still going to use the uh, virtual virtual work. We're still going to say this is true. That hasn't changed. Uh, we're still going to assume that alpha of y is some summation of n, a sub n. But now we're not necessarily limit, we're not going to limit ourselves to functions which uh, which satisfy individually the bounds of the So what we're going to do is we're going to take take u and let's take the general case, uh, gj d alpha dy squared dy plus one half k alpha alpha squared at y equals zero. We're still going to have that, and we're still going to substitute this into here. Uh, we also will need to uh, do similar things with the special virtual work. So let's, let's work on the potential energy first, if that's agreeable with you. I hope it is, because <laughs> that's what I want to do. Uh, we, we can do both. Uh, if I substitute in for, if I substitute in for, oh, I'm sorry. All right. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to get a new uh, ah, camera. Uh, 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 no, I, I think by just my pad, that helps too. Okay, sorry about that. So we're going to start off with principal virtual work. We're still going to assume a summation, but now these alpha ends do not necessarily satisfy all the boundary conditions. Uh, in fact, in, in the case that we're doing, the example we're doing with the spring at the root, they don't have to satisfy any of the boundary conditions. Is that good? Uh, I'm not saying that you, you, well, that's good in the sense that it gives you a certain amount of freedom. If for some reason I were clever enough to identify functions which did satisfy the boundary conditions, that's probably even better, right? But the point is, often that's not. That's really an easy thing to do, to find such functions. Well, if it, if it doesn't, if it can't satisfy the boundary conditions, how do you find that? Isn't that the shape function? Oh, I, I should underline that. When I say these functions do not satisfy the boundary conditions, they do not satisfy the boundary conditions individually. But through the Rayleigh really risk procedure, collectively, they will. But just as, in some sense, the differential equation is satisfied, to a higher and higher degree of accuracy as I add terms in this series, now the same thing will true to the truth of boundary conditions. The boundary conditions will never be exactly satisfied. But as I add terms, more and more terms, I will get a closer and closer approximation to the satisfying the boundary conditions. And that's what I'm getting this thing. Okay. So now uh, let's put one and two in three. Uh, in three, and write down the expression for you, right? Uh, I have to be a little careful because it's uh, one half, I got that part. Judel, GJ, what I have now is I have the summation over N of A sub N, D alpha N D Y squared D Y plus one half K alpha uh, what? Summation over n again, a sub n, uh, alpha n evaluated y equals zero, all of that squared. Right? And now you have to be a little careful about what you mean by squaring a series. When I square a series, I have lots of terms in, in the series and then I square itself, right? So I don't just get a sub n squared times this thing squared, I get I get a, a double summation, right? Is that obvious, or should I write that out? That's obvious. 
So what I really get is one half zero L G J summation over N A sub N D alpha N D Y times summation of and I'll use it in different index and I like M but you can choose it. Let's pull it off. Uh, a sub r, d alpha r, d y, d y, right? Plus the similar thing for, for the spring constant. Summation over n, a sub n, d alpha n, d y, times summation over r, a sub r, d alpha n, d y. So, right? right? And now I can collect terms. I, uh, first of all, I have one half. That's always nice. Now I have a double sum over n and r, a sub n, a sub r. Now I'm going to probably call this a sub nr, which is the coefficient that takes into account all the other stuff. And what is it? a sub nr is defined as the integral from 0 to L of gj d alpha n dy, d alpha r dy, dy, plus k uh, alpha n y plus 0 times alpha r dy. Right? Doesn't it that d alpha don't in the summation is the kind of extension like d alpha and d y. Half d alpha summation of oh. Thank you, thank you. I got excited, didn't I? Or I, I, I became a creature of habit right? because it was, it was the derivative up here, but not not here. Thank you. I did correct it when I got down here. Yeah. I was not paying attention. So this is alpha n of y equals zero, oops, and this is alpha r at y equals zero. All right. We're okay now? Okay, thank you. Alright. So so here's U. This is you. So and, and these are just constants, right? Uh, once I choose the alpha R N and the alpha R, then you give me the G J and you give me the value of K, it's just Alright. Now similarly when I write L W and I Use my aerodynamic model. Remember back there? I use my aerodynamic model and I use my, uh, uh, what else? I use my, uh, summation. I will get something that looks like summation over n of q sub n times delta of a sub n. Note this is a single summation. Should I go through that or shall I allow you to figure that out? Of course, the question is, what is Q sub n? Q sub n will depend on, on the A's, it turns out, okay, as well as what, um, C, D, C, L, D, alpha, right, maybe? Here's what you have to do. Remember what, what delta W is, it's, it's this thing. But then you have to write this in terms of lift and E and MAC and all those other things. And the lift in turn depends on alpha, and the alpha will be written in terms of the summation. Okay? So another way to write this is it will turn out to be a double sum. <laughs> uh, QNR, not to be confused with this. Uh, times a sub r times delta a sub n. Of course, I haven't told you what those coefficients are. I have told you, I think, or at least hinted, how you would go about finding them. Do you want to go through that in more detail, or, or, or is that sort of clear to come out that way? Uh, I, I see a variety of responses. Oh, well, let's do the whole thing. I, I, up, in for a pay, in for a pound. Let's do the whole thing. So, uh, just, just keep this in mind with the question mark. <laughs> okay. Let's see if that's really true. 
Um, okay. But before I do that, I'm going to assume it's true and sort of give you the bottom line with respect to rate of risk. And then we'll go back and, and do this in a little more detail. Is that fair enough? Okay. So let's assume that del W can be expressed this way provisional. So I've got this equation, which I'll call equation 5, which tells me what you apply. And I've got this equation, I'll call equation 6, which tells me what del W is. So now let's write down those two equations again, because I'm going to manipulate them a little bit. U is one half the double sum over N and R. And R of uh, K sub N R. A sub n, A sub r. That's equation 5. And equation 6 yet to be shown to be true, but I, I, I plan to show this is going to be true. Is equal to the sum of, summation over n of summation over r of q sub n r, A sub r, times delta of A sub n. Okay? And again, I'll put a question mark there. Indicating that we haven't sh really shown that in detail. Uh, you can almost imagine if it's true, but maybe you're not quite convinced yet. Now, what do we want to do? We want to use the principle of virtual work to determine our equations of motion. Remember, we're trying to, or equations of equilibrium. We're trying to determine some equations which allow us to compute the age, right? Okay. So let's, let's the first of all then compute del u. We already have del w if you accept my form, right? Let, let me get, compute del u. And now I'm going to compute del u, uh, in the following way. Uh, it's equal to one half the summation over n, the summation over r, of the k sub n r times a sub n times delta of r. KR plus one half the summation over N and the summation over R, the case of NR, delta of A sub N times AR. Right? I'm using the product rule. And I'm treating delta, the delta like it's a differential operator, which is, is the accepted convention. Well, but that's really equal to what? It's equal to the summation over N, the summation over R, the case of NR, AN, delta AR, or vice versa. Why? Because case of NR is symmetric. What do I mean by symmetric? Case of NR, K sub n r is this thing. And if I interchange n and r, I get the same thing. So k sub 1, 3 is the same as k sub 3, 1, and that's true of all the possible integer subscripts, right? So these two terms, these two summations, if I, in, if I, if I interchange r and r, n and r, I get the same thing, right? So just one. And I could, I could either make this k r times delta a sub n or and, and sum over uh, Okay. Okay. Now, <coughs> this is the only So this is now, uh, equation seven. So now I've got del w here and del u here, and I want to go del u plus minus del u plus del w equals zero. And I want to invoke the fact that, oh golly, well, since you agree with me, I'm going to, I'm going to do pull a slide on hand. I made this del a n, right? 
So I'm now going to invert the N and the R, but if I do that, I still get the same answer. Okay. So I'm going to make this AR, excuse me. Yeah, make this AR and this AN. Just so I'll have the consistent notation between these two. Because now I'm going to say the coefficient of each of the del AN, the total coefficient of each of the del AN must be zero. Right? So, then that, what does that tell me? That tells me that uh, from here, the summation over R alone of K and R, K sub R, with a minus sign, plus uh, uh, this summation over uh, R with Q and R, K sub R, must be equal to zero. So now, this is my equation of equilibrium. And that's the equation of equilibrium that Rayleigh Ritz tells me is correct. If I use functions to satisfy all the bounding conditions, this equation and what I got out of Gorkin would be exactly the same. If I use functions that do not satisfy the bounding conditions, Gorkin will just give me the wrong answer because there's no way in Gorkin of dealing with the bounding conditions. So here, what happened to the bounding conditions? Well, where did the boundary conditions come from? The boundary conditions came from looking at, at the central energy, basically, right? And then uh, doing that del operator and integrating by parts and getting the tail term and that produced the boundary conditions. Here, I don't do any of that, okay? And the boundary conditions are implicitly satisfied. So, you have to choose like, the right. Right. Well, you, the rule in really with is you cannot violate any of the geometric bounds. Remember what geometric bound condition? The geometric, in, in, in the case of our limit, certainly, in, in the case of our limit, I, I would, I, even, even a really good so if I have a, a rigid clamp support there, I have to use functions that satisfy that bound condition. I don't have to use functions that satisfy the, the free end bound condition. Really, risk will take care of that for me. In the work, I have to satisfy both sets of bound conditions. Okay. Now, I'm glad you asked that question. Now we go to our homework part where I have a spring here, right? At the root. This is no longer a geometric bound condition. So if I can twist the root now because I have a spring with a finite distance, right? So if I use these functions with zero at the root to do this problem, even using really risk, I wouldn't get the right answer. But I would have overlaid these strings and columns. I would be insisting that out of zero here, right? If I use these functions, because all these functions satisfy the bound condition. If I use the eigenfunctions associated with this, Problem that we worked out the other day. I, I, all my alpha n had to be zero there. And no matter how many of them I add together, if they're all zero there, any linear combination of them is also going to be zero. And that's not true for this configuration. So I, I did not use these functions. So in equation A, is like the, the, are the geometric boundary conditions like, are they implicit? Like, are they, are they, well, if I'm thinking of this problem, where there are no geometric bound conditions, all both bound conditions here and here are implicit in this, provided I use a good set of functions. We haven't talked about what that good set of functions is. But yes, we're, we're about to do that uh, in the time left. But uh, all I'm pointing out to you is using these functions, which require that alpha be zero at the root, would never give you a good answer whether you use work or ready or anything else. Right. <laughs> There's no way you can get there from here. Right? Yeah. But the good news is, if I use a good set of functions which do not overly constrain the problem, 
I can, in fact, use Rayleigh Ritz to set to work this, this problem. Whereas if I use work, then what I would have to do is I would have to, for every possible value of the spring constant, I would have to find a new set of functions, a new set of functions, which for that spring constant satisfies this kind of condition with this one. So for three limits, if I can find them, I just need one set of functions forevermore for whatever the k value is and whatever the variation of g, j, and c, and e, and all those other wonderful things. Whatever their variation may be with respect to that. Okay. I have a question yeah. for uh, about the distribution or what I'm going to do. If we put the rotation of the screen, the rotation of the screen, the root of the screen, yeah. the screen how is that representing our screen? Because how is that an extra sense of one? Yeah, because of the root of the screen, it should not be. Well, first of all, I can build a wind top model that has its characteristic. You'll agree with that, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's been done. Uh -huh. But in terms of a real airplane, think of it as the flexibility of the attachment between the wing and the fuselage. In the fuselage, the point as well. So the fuselage is essentially providing strain to the wing. Right? Oh, okay. As the fuselage is very rigid, and assuming that the wing is flat to the fuselage, it's probably a pretty good proposition. But that fuselage is somewhat more flexible. The wing weight and the fuselage weight are somewhat comparable. Remember, there's a lot of fuel in the wind, right? So then, then there may be an equivalent spring associated with the attachment between the wing and the fuselage. In which case, this is, this is a simplified model. But nevertheless, the model is, that captures that qualitative effect of the attachment between the wing and the fuselage. Okay. Or between, uh, it, it's, I know you're a true between the blade and the disc, right? If the disc is very rigid, then this is small. If the blade is flexible, uh, then it gives rise to an effective spring. Now, we could replace the spring with a beam structure representing the fuselage. That would be the next level of physical realism to add to the model. But for present purposes, it's just like a spring there. Sufficient to our needs. Okay. So, now, moving right along. What functions are we going to use? What, what are these wonderful magic functions we're going to use that are valid for all possible uh, spring constants, chord, distance from the AC to the EA and GJ and all of that? What, what magic functions should we use? Oh, I'm supposed to tell you. No, no, no. no, no. This, this is a, a key metric. And, 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 and uh, you don't need to give me the correct answer. Just give me an imaginative, creative answer. Well, we know, we know these functions are the ones, right? Because this constrains it to be zero then. So we want some functions which are not constrained to be zero then, right? Uh, we want functions that are not concerned to be zero here or there either. Right? So we want the deflection of each mode to be non zero up <laughs> until then. Okay. But, but we still want zero to be able to be achieved at the end. Well, you know, only in the limit of k alpha becoming very large. If yeah. the string constant becomes very large, then, then in the limit. Although there's a tricky limit if you go right with this thing. Right. Yeah. We, the, the mode should sum up so that, that, that the alpha at the root gets smaller and smaller as k alpha gets bigger and bigger, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the quantum mean you should be able to derivate that function of your type. No, it'd be nice to have functions which, which are smooth and their derivatives are just all those good things. Uh -huh. That would be good. Well, we probably want to find a set of eigenfunctions, right? I mean, we found a set of eigenfunctions here, right? We're going to find a few. You are going to find a set of eigenfunctions here in, in Homework. And those eigenfunctions, uh, you're going to find uh, eigenfunctions in various values of k, or on the initial k. Essentially, this spring constant y says a g k. So let's think about.
about these functions, you're going to find. You know. You're going to find the eigenfunctions, or you can, you can find the eigenfunctions from the first half of the pit, right? Uh, you could pick a value of k and say, I'll use the eigenfunctions for that value of k to try to solve this problem for any other value of k. You could do that. Uh, okay. You wouldn't want to choose k to be 100 because that gets you back here. So if you don't want to use k in 100, what other k might you be? Well, that would be good. There's even a better choice, I think. It yeah. depends on, 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 on how big the spin constant is. Well, be, one would be but probably a non-dimensional one. We're talking about a, and, right, we're talking about a, a ratio of k alpha to gj or with an L going around or something. I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Uh, okay. But, but what other than one, what other value? We don't want infinity. One would be probably okay. But there's another value that, that I'm told the professional would be interested in. Well, what, you got infinity, one, what's the other number? Zero. zero. Why would you use zero? Well, because that means there's no constraint at all, right? And then, but then I added a number of modes and I put them together and whatever the k is, those modes collectively will satisfy the bound condition for any, any k value. So people use, they usually would use k to zero. Now, you think when you do your homework, you may be a little perplexed because when k equals zero, or the non-dimensional k equals zero, what do you think that divergent dynamic pressure is? It's zero. I mean, right? If I it's just had a wing and it's not restrained to the standard, it must have reversed right away. Yeah, but not at zero. Though. I mean, it's just like no, it's, if k goes to zero, the divergence goes to zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But that doesn't mean I can't solve the mathematical problem that determines the timing function, right? And it doesn't mean I can't use this method and go back and use these either functions and solve the problem for all values of k. And all possible combinations of C and E and GK. Way I go. And the equations of motion are always the same. All right? Always the same. <coughs> okay. That's really good. And that's why some people like really good. The counterpart of really good is there's a dynamic counterpart. And that's when we, that when we do the flutter problem, we're going to use really good to do it. You see, it'll perhaps a little more clearly here. Ah, I didn't do del w, did I? I said I was going to do that. Well, let me find out if there are any other questions, and then I'll either do del w in the 10 minutes that remain, or I'll do del w next time we have a class. Yes. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, you'll have a question. <laughs> okay. I thought you, I thought you were about to ask some penetrating questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'll call them before I go ahead and, and do the whole uh, manipulation with del w. Do you have any questions? And the answer is? Uh, no, we don't have any That's questions. a good answer. Okay. Right. Del W. Remember what Del W is. This is a Briefly, Del W is the integral from zero to L, M sub Y, uh, Del alpha, dy. And M sub Y is MAC plus LE. And I'm going to set that to zero because it doesn't have to. I mean, you can, I, 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 you'll see it doesn't matter very much. And the L is uh, QC DCL D alpha times alpha times E. That's, that's still M sub Y. And then del W is then, I can take the Q outside, which is FC. Now I have the integral from zero to L to C. I'll even let the T all the alpha possibly depend on Y. E alpha del alpha D1. Right? And then alpha is summation over uh, N 
of uh, A sub n, alpha sub n, yeah, and del alpha, I could make this n again, but then I will get confused when I write this product, right? So I'm going to make this a summation over R, A sub R, delta A sub R. Is that A equal? Or, or is, that, is that what I used before? Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry? No, 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 no. Sorry about that. I want to do it the other way around. Remember, I can, I can interchange these subscripts, right? So, to get me where I want to go most efficiently, I'm going to call this R and R and R. And I'm going to call this N and N and N and N. Sorry about that. And you might ask, well, how do I know to do this? Of course, quick answers I've done before. If you did it the wrong way at the end, you'd have to rearrange the subscription by doing it this way. I don't have to do that at the end. So, so I have, uh, now, let's see. I'm going to call this equation. Yeah, I forget. Eight. So here I'm 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I'm going to use uh, 13. Plus 14 and 12 and produce the following. I'm going to have del w equals q. Uh, I have a summation over r, a sub r times delta a sub n, also a summation over n. And then I have this integral, and the integral is y. So C, BCL, D alpha, E, alpha sub n from here, and uh, oh, oh, sorry about that. I'm doing this too fast. This is going to be this is going to be alpha sub n, right? Times del A sub n. Uh, alpha sub uh, R from here. And alpha sub n from here, dy. And therefore, this q sub n r that I kept talking about a moment ago is clearly something I want to find to be the q times this integral. I've done that for And as advertised, see, that's the important thing. As advertised, del W is going to be a summation over uh, R, a summation over N of Q N R P sub R times delta P sub N. And that's the form I used a moment ago to write down the equation of equilibrium. Of course, in practice, you probably just would want to do this first, but I wanted to tell some of the things about really rich. And this is just, you know, the manipulation that needs to be done. Okay, so uh, that's that story. I think I'll stop with that for the day. Other, uh, things to think about. Uh, so, what have we accomplished? We have, we have two methods. Lurkin is still using the literature. You still see people using Lurkin. So you have to be a little careful in your choice of functions, or, uh, or you're more limited in your choice of functions, or really risk. And most people would do really risk. Right? And either method with an appropriate set of functions will give you a good answer. Okay, so uh, where are we going to go from here? I think we have a couple of options. I think we'll, we'll, next time we'll talk about uh, control service reversal in this context. So we'll put our wing back off here. Now we'll add a control service. But, you know, this is just to add some aerodynamic terms to our model, right? We can still use Glurkin if we... If we want to, are careful. We can use Rayleigh Reds. We can do whatever we like and, and do the control service problem. And we can do the control service problem for wings that are not necessarily in constant property, right? By using good function and you know, really rips or a pillar and a shape function. So you can have a separate shape function for the main body instead of oil and the control service? Tell me that one more time. So you're going to have like a, so you're going to have like a quarter method. Yeah. Are you going to use it for like the main airfoil and another one for the control surface? Well, that's, that's interesting. The 
prescribed, right? But now, if you're doing this for Airbus or Boeing, you might treat the control surface as being the form book as well. Mm -hmm. And it might have its own GJ, which might be different from the GJ of the ring. So in this class and then you would have to account for the fact that they're connected here. Yeah. Uh, I was going to do the simple case. <laughs> That's okay. But, but yes, you're, you're absolutely right. If, if you're doing this uh, uh, for pay, or if you're getting paid to do it, they might insist that you treat this as its own GJ and this is its own GJ. Yeah. But you can still write down potential energy for the wing, potential energy for the control surface. You have to think about how these things are connected and take that into account appropriately. Are you going to assume that they have a common point of connection here along? Or is this connected only a discrete point? Or is this multi-segment? I mean, you can make this a lot more interesting and much more elaborate. But the same methodology is still, is still applied. It's just that you have many more pages of algebra and the computer code gets a little larger. Okay, so we'll do a reversal next time. Yes, yeah, sir. I don't think this is really cool. The information on the six point one four income is the numbers. Yeah. The virtual work, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking that you should put the virtual uh, operation operator on alpha, not on A. Because alpha is the only three cool. Well, the thing that the the part that can undergo a virtual change is A, the small a. Alpha, the both shapes, the alpha sub R, the alpha M, both are just shapes, which I'm going to select. So there, there's no very I, I select them, but there's no real variation in the sense that when this thing deforms, the alpha N or the alpha R, they do not change. What changes is is the amplitude of associated with each of those. Modes. That's what is. That's what characterizing the deprivation of the, of the structure. But then why, when we go for the uh, potential energy derivative alpha, we can fix why? We do. And by not A. Well, but remember what we're, we're okay. U was one F. It's just this one. It was this, right? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, alpha is summation over n of a sub n, which doesn't depend on y, and alpha n does depend on y. So I'm, when I differentiate this, I'm going to differentiate that. But one of the nice things about this method of, of assuming mobile form is when I put this all in, the derivatives and the integrals and all that go away once I do the integration, and I just I'm dealing with constant coefficients times the a. And it's the A's that will, will change with dynamic pressure, will change with other properties of the wind. It's not, not the mode shapes. The mode shapes are something that I am carefully selecting. Okay. Now, that's a good question, though, because that's a question that a lot of people have when they encounter this material for the first time. What, what, what is it allowed to have a virtual change? The answer is something associated with deformation. But shapes, by definition, are something that we select. The deformation comes about due to an amplitude associated with each of those shapes. It's probably a, a philosophically a little easier to see in the context of dynamics, because in dynamics, these A's become functions of time. So the motion is entirely associated with A. The shapes don't change with time, right? So it's probably easier philosophically to think of it in a dynamic context. But since we're doing statics, it's still the same idea that the A's don't change with time, but they don't change with Y either. So our alpha is our uh, change in phase plus our N uh, is our three board. Our A is our three board. Yeah, it's, it's associated with, with motion, although we're doing static, so motion is really slow, right? It's, it's, it's deforming, but it's deforming so slowly that we're not ignoring dynamics as, as of the moment. Oh, covered in textbook? Huh? And this part of A and R by the covered in the textbook. Yes, it is. You have to read that? Ah. <laughs> yes, it is. That's another, another reason you should read it. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, 
covered very carefully. This covered. I'll let you judge whether it's carefully done. Bye, Stockholm.